So at this point, Liz Truss is going to win. There is no chance. Rishi Sunak has no chance. His chance was in that first week and he did not strike. And because he did not strike, Truss ran away with this competition completely. And this should not be new. Going back to the first couple of days, even weeks, even prior to uh, the pre sort of party gate and of course the pre Sue Gray stuff, um, when Johnson was sort of first taking trouble and people were speculating about who would replace him, Liz Truss was, was running away with it. She has been consistently the most highest rated uh, member of all the cabinet, even though she's done nothing and is completely useless. <laughs> and uh, several cabinet ministers have come out. Dominic Cummings has come out and said how useless he is. Um, we've got all this stuff evidencing just how useless he is. But Liz Truss is willing to say anything and anything to get her elected. And what's funny today is we're going to, as you can see, we're going to go back to Conservative Home because this now has a lot a lot of Tories worried that Liz Truss is going to be the next prime minister. And they are worrying because she has promised the earth to a whole lot of people. And beware, my friends, the scorn of the Tory voter, because compared to maybe other sort of typical voters, their wrath and their fury can be far far more unforgiving than that of, uh, say, the average voter in the UK. So here you have a sort of sense and a story from Conservative Home, uh, from this blog written by, um, who was the guy that wrote it, um, uh, William Atkinson, um, trying to, I don't know, console himself. Because you may remember it was Conservative Home who wrote at the very beginning of this whole Tory leadership contest, begging people, saying, please, Please, for the love of God, please do not elect a po another populist. Please, we can't take it as a party. Don't do it. But just don't do it. And what are they doing? They're electing another populist. So <laughs> here we have this piece. Um, trying to at least bring that, so we say, the fantasy and the populists back into some sort of reality. <laughs> so. Before we nip over to Conservative Home, uh, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page and a WAFTation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And of course, there is a link to the um, the Pony Club as well down below. Um, and of course, there's a YouTube thank you button as well. So over we go then today to Conservative Home with the title on this of Ignore Truss's Campaign Promises. Just, just imagine that. This is the, the next future leader of the Conservative Party. And you have one of the most influential of all Conservative blogs online. And they are straight up telling you, ignore her campaign promises. Anyway, ignore Truss's campaign promises. Her premiership heralds more state intervention, more borrowing, public spending cuts, and higher taxes. So, let's begin. If you have voted for Liz Truss, expecting to see a smaller state, lower taxes, then I've got some bad news. The next few months are going to see economic misery, characterised by large-scale government intervention and a lively debate over how to pay for it. They will see a very heady dreams of the Trussonomics, assuming that she's our next Prime Minister, come smash against the rocks of the economic reality. And I'll give him this. I will give this guy this. At least he's being honest with his um, audience, telling them, you know, uh, she, uh, you know, trustonomics is not a good policy. It is going to fail spectacularly. So uh, we go, you know, he is a conservative, um, but I'll, I'll give him this. At least he's being honest with his audience, telling telling him the reality of what Liz Truss actually means. That trustonomics not going to be not going to be a thing because when it meets reality, it is going to. I agree with him. Smash against the economic rocks of reality. Anyway, it continues. Uh, having recently written about the flaws in her prospectus and the dire winter we face, today is an opportunity to marry both topics together. 
With the new energy price cap set to be announced on Friday, I must ask, is Truss ready for the challenge it possesses? And I, I might say, my friend, you are very behind the times on, on asking if Truss is, is ready for these challenges. You should have been asking this quite a while ago, you know? You should have been asking this quite a while ago. You know, this wasn't um, a, a case of, you know, uh, this is going to be a close race. No, Trust was always going to walk away with it. And the fact that you have allowed her so close and into this position, uh, that's on you, my friend, you and your fellow conservatives. Um, if, as expected, bills at, uh, for the average household rise from over 1,971 to over 3,600, we face millions struggling to keep the heating on this winter. That means mass defaults or boycotts. And since we'll be unable to import enough energy from Europe, we will face blackouts. Massive state intervention will be required to prevent panic. At least he's being honest about it. Even then, Putin may use the gas supply lines as his bargaining chip. And bills may hit over £6,000 next April. And the inflation may reach the worst predictions of 18% or more. All this adds up to the most depressing economic climate for a new prime minister since Margaret Thatcher entered office. One wonders why anyone would want the job. Nevertheless, we currently have three people keen on being our next prime minister. Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak and Truss. And whatever their respective chances of getting into number 10, each has a different strategy for dealing with the crisis. Let me just say this now. Um, this guy is, has been a massive simp for, for Rishi Sunak and in his campaign. Um, Sunak is, is gone. The idea that you are even trying to entertain the idea that Rishi Sunak is one of the three people uh, in this list to be next prime minister is fanciful. <laughs> There you go. Um, firstly, uh, Starmer has announced uh, to plan a freeze on energy bills, costing around 15 billion. In addition to the government's previous support, it would be funded by backdating the windfall tax on oil and gas companies to January. It would also, according to Labour, reduce the annual debt investment payments by over seven billion pounds. This is palpable nonsense. Holding down uh, bills. Well, into next year will be hugely costly, especially if this requires bailing out various energy companies. It has also been suggested, uh, 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 as has been the case in France, Paul Johnson from the Institute of Fiscal Studies has suggested it will be more costly than the furlough scheme if extended beyond Starmer's initial six-month period. This certainly, uh, this is this is certainly if the bills are breaking into four four thousand pounds above next year. Here's the thing: at least that's a solution. At least that is a practical solution. And you can pay for it with that windfall tax because the oil and gas companies are going to be raking it in over hand and foot. Not only that, there's a ton of other stuff that Starmer wants to do as well, which I notice you're not talking about. But hey, you know, you're a conservative blogger, so I can't blame you there. But never mind. Anyway, he continues. That means uh, the inflationly funny money creationing from the Treasury. A whole heap of new debt, higher taxes, and nevertheless, the policy is both universal, simple if not progressive, and easy to communicate. One of the flaws of the support already announced by the government, all the 73 billion of it, was that it has not been registered with the public. It is almost if Johnson's Downing Street isn't overly keen on promoting something thought up by Sunak. Aside from the cost, Starmer's approach does nothing to encourage families to use less energy. It is therefore, uh, therefore excellent politics, but economically incoherent. Um, what about encouraging people to, to use green energy? The massive conversion that, that is going along with that. You, you're, you're, you're only talking about one small part of the larger plan that Starmer has put forward. But we don't have time to go into that. But that's another video for another time. But anyway, let's go into this. Just again, this guy's a simp for Ricky Sunak. So what do you think comes next? Then to Sunak. His approach has the benefit of already being in practice. Um, okay. In May, the former chancellor announced a range of support, uh, working up from the 4,000 rebate uh, per household to 1,200 pounds to the most vulnerable. 
Uh, it was decided it was designed to shield the worst from the increases of the prices. Since then, the prices have risen much faster and further than predicted. Sunak plans to increase the support by an unspecified amount. Has also failed to stump up for all sorts of wider ranging uh, uh, measures, like pushing for insulating homes. Starmer House, notice you didn't uh, mention that. Uh, or increasing the universal credit. Again, you haven't mentioned that about Starmer. I wonder why. Um, which could have also begun to pay dividends if enacted earlier. Still, his approach is at least uh, has the virtue of being targeted. Um, yeah, uh, like I say, this guy's a conservative, so he's not obviously going to talk about the Labour plan, but never mind. Uh, but if the polls are to be believed, Sunak will not be around to extend his previous measures. And trust me, he, he, he this has been on the writing on the wall for quite some time. Uh, so uh, why you weren't waking up to this back at the beginning of this leadership contest uh, saying, you know, trust is not the person you should be backing, guys. What are you doing? Um, but there you go. Uh, so in turn, so we turn to trust. On Sunday, we saw Kersey Katang, her new likely chancellor, pledged to help would be on its way under the new Trust Premiership. This suggests the Foreign Secretary has lost her distaste, distaste for handouts. Yet, we are yet to have any specific proposals, aside from pledges to reverse the national insurance and corporation tax rises introduced by her rival, and to cut the green levies. She has also shared with her rival the lack of clarity over the scale of help required uh, to help businesses. Uh, Starmer has, again, noticed you didn't mention that when you were talking about him, but then again, there you go. Um, who will also not be helped by the energy price price cap. Many face the proposals uh, going to the wall. The recession is almost inevitable without huge assistance. We are already heading to a recession, not just because of this. It's going to be made a hundred times worse uh, by this. But uh, oh, there you go. The case for trustonomics is that... Oh, the case for trustonomics is that these measures will both put more money into consumers' pockets to encourage growth. The problem with this argument is twofold. Firstly, for millions of those affected by the national insurance rise, and Sunak reversed the raise himself back in April, only those earning above £25,000 will have to pay for it at all, and hundreds of thousands will be worse off and were taken out of paying altogether. Those saved by reversing the rest of the rise are more likely to be are those in the less in need of help this winter. And an extra £100 in your pocket is of little use to your it too if your bills are going up by £500. Secondly, cutting taxes costs money. Maintaining public expenditure and the payment of interest on the national debt means a larger debt deficit. More borrowing, thus more debt, means more debt interest, which is what we've been, I've been trying, you know, when it comes to trustonomics, this is what we've been telling you since the very beginning. So at least I'm glad he's waking up to this. But this doesn't excuse your simping for Sunak because Sunak has also said, well, I'm not going to do tax cuts now. I'm just going to do them later. Again, notice you didn't mention that when talking about Rishi Sunak. But then again, this, is, this guy's a Sunak simp. So there you go. Uh, but, but, but where were we? Um, Test. So that is even more before Truss's pledges for spending uh, more on defence, retaining the extra money for pledging uh, this government for the health and social care, and of course, in the absence of the national insurance rise. Truss's camp has reported, hopefully, to use the so-called fiscal headroom created by the higher tax receipts to raise these cuts. But we now see reports that the headroom is far smaller than expected due to the worsening economic outlook. And the dalliance with nuclear power plant or two, when whatever extra cash there is, we will have to be spent on helping voters pay their bills. If Truss does not want to indulge in the more inflationary money printing from the Bank of England by borrowing um, for more borrowing is necessary, here lies the problem. As Sunak has repeatedly pointed out, the cost of servicing our debt is rapidly increasing. The gap between the forecast and reality of the debt servicing repayments between April and June was over £4 billion. The IFS is now predicting the debt saving payments will hit over £100 billion in 2023 and 2024, as Kate Andrews has highlighted. So this is the case for raising higher taxes on those who can afford to pay more. Um, you know, this is why you maybe want to have higher taxes and, you know, tax the rich more. But there you go. Uh, that is, of course, the £50 billion more than the OBR were predicting back in March. 
That will only spike further. And investors are spooked by a trust government tinkering the Bank of England's mandate to get these rates down. The government, therefore, has to win back the support of the investors. Thatcher and Howe did that by raising taxes to reduce borrowing and control public expenditure. Trust and Katang will have to increase expenditure whilst retaining the confidence of the markets. To do so, they have two options, raising taxes or cutting spending elsewhere. Neither of these things Trust has shown much interest in doing whilst campaigning, but she will be forced to do one or both. Um, but to govern is to choose. That is especially as, according to calculations by the new statesman, the public services will require over 20 billion more just to keep spending in line with inflation. If this isn't provided, public services like the NHS or schools will face real-term cuts in the way that they did not even during the austerity years. And that is something that we have to seriously worry about. Um, if Trust does not invest that money, NHS, schools, all kinds of public services are going to find themselves in huge amounts of trouble. Um, but Trust and Katang will have little choice but to allow spending to fall and to push for further cuts as a sign that they are willing to get the government finances under control. Otherwise, despite being instinctively against it, they will have to raise taxes. And from the backbenchers, Sunak will mutter that he told us so. And a lot of Tory members will feel that they've been had. Johnson's boosterism floundered on the Prime Minister's inability to realise that the ever higher spending entails ever higher taxes. The looming crisis means that his replacement cannot stick their head in the sand. And of course, this problem will be lessened if the government pursued some actual supply side reform. Uh, again, uh, you maybe need to mention the fact how Brexit has damaged our supply side massively on this. But there you go. Uh, designed to boost growth. But as I already pointed out yesterday, Trust will inherit a uniquely unfriendly parliamentary party. If Johnson could not any get any meaningful reform through, such as house building, for example, fracking through with an HC majority or even a mandate, what hope does she have? Either way, Trust's premiership seemingly heralds a higher spending, more borrowing, and increase in government intervention. This may be forced on her by the adverse, adverse circumstances, but we don't choose the hand we are dealt. And she wants the job. It is a sign of the air of unreality around this leadership contest that more have not cottoned on to this already. And so I at least acknowledge the fact that you are acknowledging what a lot of Tories are not, that the that there is a, a massive amount of unreality around the Tory leadership contest and that you have indulged in this people. It's not just people like Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak that you have backed because Sunak doesn't have too much better ideas either. Sunak's plans would have only just been a, a, a general increase in support. Sunak would have also had to engage in more of the same thing you're saying that Truss would also have to engage in as well. And remember, Sunak lost a lot of popularity from his own party when he engaged in his own furlough scheme. Because, as one of the infamous quotes came out from that time, Sunak is showing that socialism can work. So, it is of no surprise that you have here a someone who is supporting Rishi Sunak, hoping that Liz Truss doesn't win, and is incredibly worried now by the direction of travel that this guy has been promoting for his party the direction of travel that he wants to take it in and indulging in their crazy, wacky doodle ideology that this guy has been very much in, in line with promoting and, and shoving forward and saying, yeah, this is this is the direction of travel we want, guys. But hey, um, at least maybe you're recognizing this type of person should not be allowed anywhere near number 10. And the fact that you... Guys, and this is all on you, and the Conservatives have allowed this person, this woman, to be in such a close position to power is not on us, it's all on you. And the direction of travel, you have allowed the Tory party to go. Because trust is only following the right-wing libertarian ideology that has been pushed in the Tory party going all the way back to 2016 by the ERG, and now they are fully in control of the party. And if you want to warn against all this and the panic and the worry that the damage this is doing, that's all on you guys. We've got nothing to do with this, you know. Um, 
you know, what is it? He who eats, you know, biscuits in bed sleeps with the crumbs. Well, that's the case where you are now. You've made your bed with your crazy libertarian ideology. So now you've got to sleep with it. So as always, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button on your way out. And of course, remember to leave a comment down below as well. And as always, we'll see you all next time.